In this episode, I award Crocodile the James Bond villain badge. Stop telling people your plans, bastard man! Welcome to the journey. Welcome to the crew. We think we're pretty funny, and we hope that you will too. This is the opening song to season two. It's where the journey really starts because we've made it out of East Blue. We've got our snacks and we've got our friends. Now it's time to discuss the anime that never ends. Yeah! Start the show! Hello, fellow adventurers of the Grand Line. Welcome to episode 44 of King of the What Now. We're a podcast that discusses the anime One Piece. Sometimes we bring up the manga when relevant. Uh, I am Joel. I'm your host. I'm also a longtime fan of the series. I love it to death. And I'm Curtis, your co-host, uh, and I am a One Piece novice. And I'm Kat. I'm the ghost on the show, and also I am the guardian deity of podcasts. Mm, you guys forgot very to interesting. do. I actually drink water that's going to give me incredible strength, but then I'm going to die immediately Oof. after drinking it. Oh, I was going to do that one, actually, but I'm already dead. <laughs> you drink it a little while ahead of me. first. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Take Wait, that, Joel. Really quick, since we love reference jokes, would you say that if it increases your strength a lot, but you really only get one shot, would you say that you have to end the fight in one punch? Perfect. Yes, I would say that. Which episodes did we just finish watching? We ended up watching four episodes this time. They were episodes 118, 119, 120, 121. For those of you following at home, we got the end of the Nami Zoro fight, and then we got a lot of crocodile uh, monologuing and a lot of people trying to thwart his plans. They're not very good at it. And then a surprise guest appearance from the person you'd least suspect. I will let Curtis go give the details. Yes. All right. So we start off where we left off uh, with Nami fighting Miss Doublefinger. Uh, She was struggling with the climb attack last we saw, but this time she figures out finally how to use its ultimate move by blowing bubbles and also using a cuckoo clock mechanism inside the staff. Um, So she defeats Miss Doublefinger that way. Um, at the end of that episode, we get a very brief monologue, um, I guess a conversation between Crocodile and King Cobra, and they continue to talk about Pluton, and then they talk about something called, a a Poneglyph, um, and then we have Zoro, he's fighting Mr. One, uh, who is made out of steel and blades, and Zoro's getting his butt kicked, then he realizes that he needs to be able to... F- cut through steel and he has a flashback uh to him and his master he figures out that what he needs to do is feel the rhythm of the things around him and he feels the rhythm of mr one and then he's finally able to cut him in a way we all have rhythm inside of us it's what moves us it's what um, grooves us yeah it's what moves us (laughs) and what grooves us um it's the singing of the bees and the whispering of the trees uh you can't stop the music exactly joel it's I, I, you have a poet inside of you. You didn't even know it. That is the, uh, the village people, just so you know, in case you didn't know. I, I, it was a, yes. But. I didn't know, so thanks for explaining. That was a great reference joke. So Zoro is trying to learn... Well, and he figured it out. Yes. He figured out yes. the rhythm so of all things. I, That's where we were in the summary. Yes, so then he uh, defeats uh, Mr. One. And then we have a bunch of flashbacks that, for the most part, we were kind of like, okay, flashbacks. Um... Koza, though, at the end of that third episode, shows up um, to where Crocodile and all the people are up by the palace, and Crocodile monologues and tells him his plan, and uh, and Koza's like, oh no, I gotta stop this fight. So he goes down, and he goes to stop the fight, and then he gets shot in the back by some Baroque's work members who are disguised as city guards, um, which causes the fighting, which had briefly stopped, to start up again. Then Crocodile, back up at the palace is monologuing to Vivi, and then he's going to drop her off of the uh, the cliffside. He does drop her, and then, descending from heaven, is Luffy. Bow, 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 the hero returns! On the back of a majestic falcon, no yes. less. It was glorious. I'm so glad he's alive. Did you expect him to be alive? 
No, I thought I thought the main character of this of this TV show was dead for sure for all, all of the next hundreds and hundreds of episodes. I mean, it's an ensemble cast, right? So he could have been dead. True. Well, and especially when they showed him being rescued by Nico Robin, I've been thinking about this for the last several episodes of the podcast while we were watching. I think that if I had a time machine and I could make small changes, if I made too many big changes, One Piece wouldn't be what it is today. But I think that I would have him being rescued the same way, but just don't show the viewer. And then when he shows up in this episode and everyone's surprised, have a really quick flashback that shows um, her saving him. Or maybe even leave out that detail, leave the person, leave the viewer wondering and then have another flashback when relevant with Miss All Sunday because she's still not out of the picture. She might have an episode that might be more centered on her and that might be the better time to bring up something like that. For sure. I think that would have been better in terms of suspense, but I also think that that reveal that she saved him could be used for Miss All Sunday character moments down the line. That's true. Yeah, so the, the only thing that I got left is, uh, so Luffy showed up. He has a big jug of water on his back, and he figures out that if he wets himself, he can... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to rephrase that. wetens himself. Yes. If he puts water on his skin... He Moistens is, his body. Yes. Um, he is able to make contact with Crocodile. And he just decks him. On an emotional him. level. <laughs> yeah. it, how satisfying was it to see Bastard oh. Band finally get punched in the face? The best part is he starts to turn to sand and then he gets punched in the face. Oh, oh it's so, it's good. so good. The, well, not only do we want Crocodile to get punched, but the music is playing. It's like the villainous music as he's slowly turning. And then he gets punched and the music abruptly cuts. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Well, and he's got this expression on his face as he's turning into sand that's very smug and very, ha ha, I'm better than you. And then he gets punched and it instantly changes to what the heck just happened to my face <laughs> why has my world suddenly been flipped upside down it's like uh captain hammer when he gets blown up <laughs> is this, this is what pain feels like yes that How was wonderful. your succinct summary from curtis that was a wonderful summary curtis you did a great job thank you i, I you know i'm so happy that we can build each other up here on king of the one now i agree I feel like we got a lot of really good information in these episodes, especially the first two. Um, Starting off with Crocodile talking about Pluton. So he said two things that I thought were really telling and interesting. One of them was that he would, the weapon Pluton would make him more powerful than the world government and would bring all the pirates in the area under his control. And then he also said that it would be a dreamlike country. So I'm really curious why this guy, who seems to be kind of a bastard that hates everybody and hates friendship, why is he after this peaceful, powerful country? And do you think in his mind, the peace that he plans on bringing justifies all the death that he's causing? I, part of me doubts that he actually cares about that part. I think that that is all just him trying to justify his grab for power. Okay. Like, it's not, it's not about the... He doesn't actually care about the ends. The ends are only important to him because it justifies what he's doing. Okay, so you think he wants power for power's sake rather than wanting power to protect something or to protect himself or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Joel, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's interesting that he thinks that it would be a perfect, peaceful country if it has a bunch of pirates in it. I know he's saying that he's going to unify them, but... Just given what we know about the typical pirate crew, you'd think that infighting would start eventually. Well, and yeah, it seems like he and Luffy have very different approaches to this idea of peace, because for Crocodile, it's I'm the strongest and I can blow them up if they don't do what I say. Whereas for Luffy, it's I'm their friend and I'm protecting them. And that's why we'll be Mm -hmm. peaceful Mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Continuing on the Pluton stuff, uh, I also thought it was interesting that so one, he, he identifies the strength of it. So he says that it could be used to obliterate an entire island. Uh, but he also noted that it was an ancient weapon, which I thought was an interesting piece, piece of world building. So they keep emphasizing how old Alabasta is and that it's you know been around for 4,000 years. Um, I just I find it interesting that there in this world there is a weapon that is ancient enough that people have forgotten when it was made. But it is stronger than any weapon that exists in present day. That is a great point. Also, he mentions that it's been sleeping in Alabasta. Do you guys think that was a metaphor or is it like a dragon? <laughs> uh, I, it, it could go either way with One Piece. 
I would prefer it not be a dragon. I'd prefer it be something kind of sillier, maybe like a giant turtle. It could be the shell of a turtle, but like the head of a dragon, and the fire breath is the thing that can blow up islands or whatever. But yes, it, for those keeping track at home, and for you, Curtis, I'm willing to give away kind of this general idea that's kind of spoilerish, I guess. End game, you're going to have a bingo card of all the things that are going to come into play, the One Piece slash Pirate King is probably going to be part of however the story has its climax. The world government doesn't seem like it's going away anytime soon, and the Navy seems like it has some corrupt jerks in it. Uh, the Poneglyphs and the Ancient Weapon, Pluton? I'm pretty sure that that's also going to be on the bingo card. I can't say for sure, but it seems like this is a big piece of world building that you can't just say, oh yeah, that's never going to come back. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I... I'm still I I know you've dismissed it. I'm still leaning on the the idea that One Piece is some far flung future, if not necessarily of like Earth, but just in general. Okay. And that in the past the ancient civilizations were much more technologically advanced mm. and that something happened and then this is just kinda like the remnants of humanity now. They kind of destroyed themselves with their island busting weapons yeah well because like so you have you have the the pluton um i could see like the the oh, i don't remember what they're called the transmission snails the, uh, the um, transponder snails. yes i could see that being almost like a like a biotechnical like mm -hmm. something um the fact that they're all using sailing ships could be an indication of resource depletion that they oh. depleted resources to such a point that they like any technology that required some sort of fuel, like they didn't have any fuel left. So they just use sailing ships in that to get around. Now I could see a lot of things where it would be that could indicate some sort of far future thing. Reverse mountain is actually a uh, hydro pump that pulls water up to the very top. And then that's how you explain the magic. mountain. I, I'm not saying that there isn't magic. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, no, I think that's pretty great. Uh, Joel mentioned the Poneglyph as an end game. What do you think of that? We got literally no information about it, really, other than its name. Well, just really quick. What we got was, um, give him Joel a second for his brain to reset. That's not technically true. What we got is, or just as a refresher, I guess I should say, Crocodile asked Cobra, where's Pluton? And he said something about, like, I don't know, or I've never heard that name. I don't know what that is. And Crocodile goes... I think you're partially telling the truth. I think you're misleading me on purpose. Can you tell me where the Poneglyph is? And he goes, yeah, I'll, I'll lead you there if you say Vivi. Was that the deal? It was Vivi, yeah. Okay. Might have been Vivi and Koza. I don't remember if he was there yet at he that wasn't. point. Okay. Anyways, yeah, because so, this is just episode one. So I guess what I'm trying to hint at is that there might be a connection between the Poneglyph and Pluton, or they might be similar in power or use. Okay, that's, so, that's what I'm saying is that we have that hint. Right, so it kind of sounds like what maybe is being implied is that it's another weapon. Do you think that's likely or do you think it's something else? No, I my assumption is it's like some sort of uh, repository of knowledge or like uh, a, some form of text or something like that. It's, it's an a, information source. It's a user manual for Pluton. Yeah, something like that. Because glyphs we know mean writing. Yeah. So it's definitely something written. Yes, and that, that's that's... Really, the only reason, the only thing I'm going off of. In your vigorous research that you did to prepare for this episode, did you find out what pone means as no. a prefix? Okay. No. I definitely thought it was pony. So I was like, it's a pony glyph. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, a picture of a tiny horse. <laughs> yes. Wait, would you, would, would that mean that this is a repository of information if that is in fact correct? That is a horse. Would you give it a name, or would you be riding through the desert on a horse with no name? Oh, Reference joke. you did it. <laughs> Man, episode one, just not one, 118, the first episode we watched tonight really was my favorite of these episodes. Um, hmm. Other than all of the stuff we've already discussed, a really big standout moment for me was when Nami said, this doesn't hurt at all compared to what she's going through, and she was able to push through the pain of her injuries for Vivi's sake. And got stabbed through the foot. I really oh. just need to point that out. She's now taken one through the calf and one through the bottom of her foot. And the, the foot thing was a choice. Like yes. she she stopped Miss Doublefinger with her foot and like knowing that she was going to get stabbed in the foot. Not to steal a page out of Peace Together's book, but that was a hit that you felt. <laughs> like that was painful to watch. 
It really was. Uh, and we're going to get to it in a second, but also the Zoro fight was very hard to watch as well at certain points. Do you think that Miss Doublefinger can give people tetanus? Do you think that <laughs> Chopper's going to be... Shots. Exactly. Well, I mean, that would, if... Probably not. She had to be. She'd have to be rusty. That's true. Yeah, because her spikes aren't made of metal. Interesting. Her spikes are made of her hair, her boobs. Somehow, that's weird. Her uh, chin. Her chin. There was one where she did her lips, and that was hilarious. Mm-hmm. I feel like if we slowed that down, we would get a re- lot of really funny single frames. Yes. Um. But yeah, that that quote from Nami was meaningful to me because it's one of the first times we've really seen Nami put her life on the line for another person. Luffy does it all the time. Usopp has learned to do it. Zoro and Sanji don't explicitly do it, but they do it. Uh, And this is the first time Nami has found something that she really cares enough about to sacrifice herself this way. The other thing about Nami's fight was that the whole thing, every single piece of it, was designed to mislead the viewer. Which is interesting to me because Nami as a character is very misleading. She is a sneaky kind of person. And so having her weapon work differently than you would have expected or having her attack in ways that are confusing, having the mirage, for example, these are all things that are very Nami-like in nature. Uh, Curtis, you mentioned in your summary that she used her final attack. What was that final attack called again? It was a tornado tempo. That's tornado it. Tornado tempo. Did it fire a tornado? It did not. Even though, even though I'd like to point out, the weapon appears to be capable of forming an actual tornado. It did not. No. What did it fire? A little bird from, from a cuckoo clock. None of us were expecting cuckoo birds. Bam. Nami had a misleading fight because she's a misleading person. Yes. I will also just piggyback off of what you said. This is the first time that we've seen her put her life on the line in that way. And then also she started off the fight running and then she kind of turned around. And so we already commented on this in the last episode, but this really is Nami coming into her own place on the crew when it comes to fighting. She's already been helping out being kind of the nurse before Chopper showed up and also being a world-class uh, navigator. But now she's kind of fighting with the the big boys, kind of pun intended, because she is the only female character on the crew right now. Huh. We do have some small boys on the crew too, though. I'd call Usopp and Chopper small. I mean, Chopper is supposed to be like, he feels like he's like eight or so in age or maybe like 12. He's 15 canonically, but I don't know what human age his maturity relates to. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So Nami uh, is a wonderful character. I'm glad that she now has a kind of fighting style that is her own. Uh, I don't know how far she could have gone with the staff in terms of uh, kind of amazing powers when she's compared to a shape-shifting reindeer and a guy who creates exploding stars and and a rubber person. Zoro's fight was where it was at for me. Uh, I'm glad that Nami had that moment, but Zoro was... We have never really seen him struggle. The only time that he's failed to do something was against Mihawk, and that was like an instant loss. But in this one, we get him acknowledging his weakness. It's been foreshadowed and alluded to before, but he says, we're going to do this fight, and at the end, I'm going to win, and I'm going to be better because of it. We and had a major level up moment for exactly. him, essentially. 100%. Um, he's really on like the next level. He learned a new technique in the middle of battle, which I would say we haven't had. So far, we've only had uh, character moments where, say, Usopp has decided that he's going to fight instead of running away. And we've had characters maybe uh, uh, get trapped in situations, but we've never seen anyone say, I'm fighting at full power and that's still not enough. I need to go even further beyond. Um, but yeah, so I, I really like that fight. And Curtis, did you did you see that uh, ending? The, the Him hearing the rhythm of the stones and yes. the tree? You cl- you... Yes, I actually really liked that part. Uh, I don't know, uh, the... It took me off guard because I was not, I was expecting Zoro to be like, I don't need a sword to be a swordsman. I'll just use like, you know, like he'd make energy swords or <laughs> like he'd move his hand and it'd be like, or something like that. And the, I, the, the explanation that I got for why he could suddenly cut through more stuff was 
oddly satisfying to me. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's like you become in tune with everything around you. Would you call this, would you say he has psychic powers? Is that what this is? I don't know if I would, I wouldn't call it psychic. It's it's more spiritual. It's like, it's it's okay. a very, like, it's almost like a, it, it seems like it'd be like Zen or something like, you, you know. stumbled upon it. Uh, I, bl- I don't remember who first figured it out, but it's been confirmed that I believe that Zoro is the closest to Buddhism in his beliefs out of uh, the, the members of the crew. And there are allusions to the Buddhist religion through Zoro. And so when you were trying to come up with the word, I was like, please tell me he figured it out. Yeah, I just. I don't know enough about Buddhism or oh, no. anything no, that, to be able to like. We'll, I, we'll point it out when it's relevant. Okay. Do you think this ability to you know zen in on yourself and hear the rhythm of all things is this a swordsman specific thing? Is it a Zoro specific thing, or could the rest of the crew learn how to do it as well? Probably the rest of the crew could learn how to how to do it and apply it. Um, I'm curious if it's a wider swordsman thing or if it was something that was specific to his master because I it's. It's clear that his master was trying to lead him to figure this out. I and he kept talking about it in in terms of a swordsman, but it could it seems like it'd be something that would be applicable to any fighting style. Right. Well, and like imagine Nami being able to just know where the money is. She'd be the <laughs> ultimate thief. I think what you <laughs> or, would get in Oh, sorry. Sorry. Or she'd be the ultimate person on Wall Street. Huh. I just know where the money is. <laughs> I know where to invest. Perfect. <laughs> and if she could sniff it out, she'd be almost like a wolf on Wall Street. Uh, <laughs> very well done. Snaps for Catherine. Um, I don't know what that was. Joel, edit that out. <laughs> no, Joel, leave that in. <laughs> leave that in. Leave this in, too. Perfect. Um, I think what you would get with certain members of the crew is, like you guys just pointed out, Nami would kind of be good at finding the money. I think that you could specialize in kind of what your... I think Zoro is his surroundings and, like, the different materials, because he needs to know how hard to slice, I guess. But I could see Luffy being more focused on the meat. I could see Usopp specifically being able to find the weakness in an opponent's Mm -hmm. armor by kind of, like tuning in i guess and then uh sanji would just be women he would figure out he would figure out either the thing that they like best and like how to appeal to them or maybe i could see him seeing the one thing that they're self-conscious about Mm -hmm. you know that girl is worried about the way her hair looks and so sanji comes up and says lady i think that your hair is beautiful if i snap my fingers just so nami's bikini top comes undone (laughs) i mean i wouldn't he would do it he would do it he absolutely would um, in all seriousness, I could see like Nami it being more in tune with the atmospheric conditions around her and being able to better use the climb attack. Oh yes, this is a shonen anime. Nothing, nothing is sacred. Uh, anything that can help someone fight better or sense the life force of other people—that's a—that's a thing. But I really like where your brain is on this, Curtis. I think that if you pay attention, you might see some more interesting pieces of this. I do want to. I, I do want to circle back really quick. I even with all of the knowledge that I have from the next, you know, seven hundred chapters or however many there are, I'm still a little confused as to what exactly Zoro learned and what exactly Koshiro was trying to teach him. Because Koshiro says there are swordsmen who can cut nothing, and those are the same ones that can cut anything. Because apparently, once you can hear the voice of something, you can choose to not cut it or cut it. And then he goes. And only swordsmen that know how to protect can learn this technique. Or at least that's what I remember him saying. I didn't write down the quote. I did. Swordsmen can protect what they want to protect, is what he said. Or they can cut what they want to cut. Right. Okay. But Zoro didn't really learn that. He wasn't trying to protect anything in particular. He was just trying to win a fight. And so I, I... I get it that, you know, the idea is that he learned this a long time ago and taken all that time to, to, to marinate in his brain, in the back of his mind, but I don't quite see how you go from point A to point B. Well, I, uh, oh, sorry, Curtis, go for it. Uh, I was just going to say, I think you're, you're focusing too much on the protect line. I think the point is that you sh- like the, the general idea that you should be able to be like a surgeon and find fine-tune mm. like you 
you cut what you want to cut, I think, is the more important line right. there. Right. If you cut indiscriminately, you're not a talented swordsman. You're just a guy waving a piece of steel around. Side note, could you imagine a surgeon that operates with a sword? <laughs> so, <gasps> could you imagine Chopper and Zoro doing surgery together? Oh my gosh. Yes. I love it. That no, would- Zoro, what are you doing? <laughs> The that other, would be perfect. The other thing about that line that's really interesting, uh, swordmen can protect what they want to protect and cut what they want to cut. First of all, after his master says it, it zooms in on a picture of Koina, who neither of them was able to protect at the time. So keeping that idea of protecting important things to you in mind is important to them. Uh, to be uh, fair, stairs are a very sneaky opponent. Stairs are dangerous. Mm-hmm. I fall down them all the time. I'm glad we don't have any in our house right now because pain uh the other thing about that is it really gave us kind of a good view of what mr one is like because as we see him attack we see him send up these huge dust clouds and we see him slice up zoro but also the pillar behind zoro whereas when zoro attacks him even with his most powerful attack after he's learned this rhythm of all things technique it does that same zoom out where we saw the dust cloud earlier and instead of seeing an explosion like that we see a peaceful sky and we see some birds flying by so mr one does not have the ability to discriminate with his sword strikes that Zoro has now learned, and that's why he lost this battle. Keeping in mind that this is a shonen anime where uh, bad guys sometimes become good guys, or sometimes bad guys receive the same power-ups as the heroes or whatever, could you could either of you imagine a situation in which Mr. One goes, he managed to cut me somehow. I wonder if there's a secret to that, and he spends some time meditating, and then maybe when he comes back, he's as precise as Zoro is. Oh, 100%. He said so at the end of the fight. He was like, next time we meet, maybe I'll be able to cut things or not cut things. I can't remember his exact mm-hmm. words. Oh, interesting. Oh, no, I didn't have anything to say. I was just okay. green. <laughs> the um, other thing, really quick, is that as Mr. One's falling, he goes, what What are you going to cut next, diamonds? And Zoro goes, there's no point in that. I think I remember seeing a different translation where Zoro just kind of goes, maybe. And <laughs> I think that is foreshadowing. There are two things about Zoro that we've seen so far that I, I am certain are foreshadowing. One, when he beat uh, Mr. Five on, uh, not Elbaf, Little Garden, he said, ooh, fire for my katanas, I'll have to try that out in the future. I want that to come back. And then number two, I want, um, shoot, what were Cutting we diamonds. About? Yeah, I want, I want there to be some situation where someone's wearing diamond armor and for some reason Zoro has to cut it. And it's like, oh, he said he would someday, maybe. What were what were the bars made out of? In sea the prism cage? stone. Sea prism stone. I'm curious if it did. Actually, I think they said, "Isn't sea, sea prism stone harder than steel?" Didn't they explicitly say I'm that? It is sure. the hardest substance in the One Piece universe. Okay, I bet you at some point he'll learn how to cut it. That's That'll another, probably be his like ultimate. Yeah, that's not another theory off. of mine. Yeah, I I wonder if Luffy's going to be trapped in sea prism stone, and Zoro will have to save him, and that brings the protect what you want to protect line all the way back, mm. and it proves that he's the best swordsman by being able to slice through anything. Yes, there was a really strange. Uh, difference in translation also when Zoro was saying that he's going to learn to cut steel. So in the Japanese translation, because we have subtitles on and those match Japanese, whereas the actual English dialogue is what the English dialogue was, uh, in the Japanese translation, he says, I'll have to learn to sympathize with you. Whereas in the English version, he says, I'll just learn to cut steel. And I think the difference between sympathizing your, with your opponent and understanding how they work and just being able to cut them is an important one. And I'm sad mm-hmm. that they messed that translation up. Yep. Agreed, actually, because that, that's like a good lead in to what the, the key to cutting through steel was for him, right? Which was just understanding the rhythms of it. Yeah. Exactly. We've uh, been on this topic for a little while. Uh, hopefully that this can be a final thought. I think that we've all said uh, everything that's on our minds. Uh, but also, i just like to point out that Zoro is the most berserker of all the different members of the crew. You know, the more blood he loses, the harder he seems to fight. But also, learning abilities from the people that he defeats is really cool, and I think it fits him really well. Luffy is just going to punch anyone who gets in his way. Usopp has to personally grow, but I don't think he learns from his opponents. Zoro seems like the type who's like, they did something pretty cool. I'm going to do that, but better. I just Mm -hmm. just remembered one more cute Zoro thing, if I can share it. 
Uh, at the end, when he's almost gotten crushed by the stones falling and they miss him, uh, he goes, I can hear everything. I can hear the spot where the stones weren't going to fall. I can hear my sword. It's over there. And the sword that he hears and picks up is the one that Koina gives him, which is just nice. Aww. The one he has the strongest connection to. I That is very intentional on his part. I'd be willing to bet money on it. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, before we continue, my snake's really cold. It, do you guys have anything that, that could help me with, with my cold snake? No, but our advertisers might. Welcome to sweaters, snake sweaters. Uh, it is a wonderful time to be a snake. Not only do you control the government, and not only are you the heroes that have saved us all, but now you can wear fashionable sweaters at all times. Made from hypoallergenic material. Uh, they can be washed as many times as you want and they won't shrink. They come in fabulous colors. Uh, and you can even sew your own custom designs into them. Are they vegan? Yes. If you choose to eat them, they, you will in fact find that they comply with every uh, diet restriction that you might have because they are made from soybeans. What if you're an all meat eater? Unfortunately, you're going to have to sew in some bacon, some pork mm. into that uh, into the sweater and then eat it at that so point. Joel, do they do they come with turtlenecks too? Some of them. Yeah, absolutely. They come with onesies. Those are a little bit longer. You know, snakes don't have legs, obviously, but they are a bit longer, so they encompass the tail. And then they have turtlenecks. And then they also have the uh, the summer fashion, the tank tops, which have little holes cut out in the sides. Or arms might be snakes have arms, but they don't. So it's just like an extra place for them to breathe. It's ventilation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it keeps them cool. And, and I would just like to say, uh, some people like to call these snakes nuggies don't call them that you will get fined a lot of money in fact i i oh yes I, boom, 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 boom. Now. copyright police here <laughs> pull up your hands no we're just doing a, an anime b- b- podcast have you ever played sound bites from that from the one piece no please no fair use Welcome back, everybody, from that beautiful ad segment. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Good news, everyone. I learned from Luffy. You just have to fight your problems. Those copyright lawyers won't be bothering us again. (laughs) Is your snake nice and warm now, Curtis? It it is very nice and warm. Excellent. So we left off finishing up Zoro's fight. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, what was your favorite part of these episodes? What did you want to discuss? Um, so... I guess... Okay. I'm gonna gonna talk about a couple things. Um, one, I feel like we should talk about Koza. Uh, he, the, the, the turning point in the battle is, I guess, it, well, it's a plotually important at the very least. So I feel like we, it deserves a little bit more airtime. Um, so like I said in the summary, he overheard Crocodile explaining what was going on, or at least heard all of them talking and figured out like, oh, the king isn't actually the bad guy. It's Crocodile this whole time. What a devastating realization, by the way. Like, I organized this whole rebel army yeah. that's tearing the country apart via civil war, and it was for no reason. Mm-hmm. That's what makes Crocodile such a threat, I think. It's not the fact that he can turn into sand. It's not the hook. It's not the people serving under him. It's this sense of despair. I don't remember if I made this comment or if it was just in my mind, but there's a lot of people who throw themselves at Crocodile and they're like, we're going to beat you. And then he just puffs into sand and then they die because their time's up or because he stabbed them. And it's just like, oh man, nothing, nothing can stop this guy. And he spends a long time digging the emotional knife into Vivi to be like, look at all the ways that you failed. Look at the way that your country is dying. And that's truly why... He's the villain of a saga and not just an arc. That's his reach. Yeah, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about him having a lot of disdain for people who are weak or stupid. So back to Koza. Yeah, so so he tries to s- step in and stop the armies, right? And he gets this close uh He's holding his fingers very close to Yes, us. <laughs> it's a, very close. It's a minuscule amount. Right? Well, he got everybody to stop. He he got the he was standing there with the 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 royal guard holding white flags, and the rebel army had stopped. Both seeing the white flags, and then seeing Koza standing with them, and he's like, "Yes, there's no reason to fight anymore. No more blood needs to be spilled on this street." And then he gets shot in the back multiple times by some Brokes Works members in the city guard, um, which to the rebel army makes it seem like the city guard has 
shot uh, Koza. Yeah, yeah like, even though he surrendered or was trying to talk them down. Yeah. yeah. Right. It looks like they faked their surrendering, basically. Yes. And then there are also some Baroque Works members in the uh in Rebels. the Rebel Army shooting back, and so then they start the fighting up again. And not only that, but a sandstorm comes out of nowhere that's so strange yeah. so they can't really hear each other and there's some confusion and vivi can't be heard from the palace up above there yeah. is a scene of these combatants literally trampling the white flag which was a very oh. on the nose visual metaphor another one was koza laying there draped in the white flag while he's dying oh yeah. I, wow see i didn't notice either of those yeah see you got to pay attention to this show with a critical eye they do a lot of stuff like that I do got to say, I miss a lot of that, too. The The fact that it's there is amazing, and that's why I love Oda so much. He does so much visually that I don't feel other anime or manga have done that I've seen. But if you do see it, it deepens my appreciation for sure. Well, Joel, if you love Oda so much, why don't you marry him? He has a wife, and it was actually... <laughs> <laughs> I love this story. Go, it was, tell it. Uh, it was a woman who was cosplaying Nami. So oh he married God. her after he started the series. That's the dream, though, right? Like, you get to marry your own characters that you invented? That actually makes me a little bit worried for Oda. <laughs> I, I told that to my dad. I told him this story when I heard of it. And I was like, isn't that the dream? And he goes, no, that's that's creepy. That's like marrying yourself. Why would you do that? So my dad and I apparently just have very different stances or levels of narcissism i'm not sure well, to be clear you should already be worried about oda because he wrote in a recent weekly shonen jump all the uh writers get to have like a short little like two sentence like hello to the readers and his was someone please trade me a legendary in pokemon go i've been playing alone in my house for the last two years <laughs> isn't that so oda. sad i just uh... i want to save him from shonen jump but also if i did that there would be no more one piece so please oda be safe. He, he could just, you know, finish One Piece and retire already. And then he could play Pokemon Go outside like everybody else. Do you think he could retire? Oh, do you mean like in terms of having enough money? Or do you think like he's the type of person who would be able to retire? Second thing. Um, I don't know enough about Oda. He's been working on this since he was 10 years old. I don't think he can ever retire 100%. Which... It's another worrying thing, but let's continue <laughs> with talking about this episode. Yes. Um. So you mentioned that Koza tried to stop. He tried to say the bloodshed is over. This for me kind of was a throwback to what Luffy said to Vivi with uh, the uh, you keep trying to end this war without anyone getting hurt or without anybody dying. And that's not going to happen. You need to accept that. She almost said that to Koza, like that exact thing. She was like, we can't totally stop everything but we can do the things that we can do mm -hmm. and it didn't really work out for her and it didn't really work out for koza and in the end vivi wasn't really following luffy's advice either because crocodile says you know you could have warned them about the bomb they would have trampled each other but you still would have saved people instead you tried to bank on nobody dying and that didn't work out for you so one thing that i do want to talk about that's kind of related to that is there's i've brought up this point a couple of times that luffy compared to other pirates has something that they lack. He believes in his dream more so than other people. We're going to get a huge piece of that uh, in the next couple of episodes. But what's interesting about this particular scenario is we're pretty sure Luffy's going to win against Crocodile. We don't know for sure, but it, it looks that way. He's the country's only hope. The, what were they called? The Quick Claw Crew? The Kicking Claw Force. The Kicking Claw Literally Force. Literally there for two minutes and then dead. Yeah, but they sacrifice themselves. They use some kind of like uh, power enhancing water or something and they lose. And Vivi tried to stop the thing and uh, she lost and um uh, uh not Co koza tried and he's he lost and so did chaka if we assume that luffy's going to be the one to win what in this case makes him the person who's going to win because in say like drum kingdom no one was willing to fight against the king except for luffy and uh, dalton right but here lots of people are willing to fight and they're not and successful, they're definitely putting so their lives on the line why is luffy going to be successful if we assume he is do you have ideas curtis uh i mean part i think he's the only person who knows that it's crocodile that's willing to face crocodile um because most everybody else sees crocodile as a hero i think part of it's happenstance okay. because he happened to run into vv and okay let me let me rephrase that part of it is fate <gasps> and fate he destiny. has he was 
Yes, he was destined to run into Vivi, and then she was destined to tell him that Crocodile was the ultimate villain. And so that put him on the path, right? Um, I don't know that, because, and we'll talk about this in a second, he figures out Crocodile's weakness. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people could have done that. Um, In hindsight, it seems a little bit obvious. Uh, You'd think somebody would have been like, I wonder what happens when he gets wet. Um, like a cat would have peed on him or yeah i'm sorry sand is basically a litter box i thought it would be funny no i i get it (laughs) i yeah that is also true and then another thing that almost every shonen battle protagonist has uh is the the determination thing the never going to give up that's what made you know naruto naruto that's what made bleach uh or anyways um, so maybe it's just that he got knocked down, those, the quick claw crew got knocked down, and the, and Chaka got knocked down, but Luffy's the only one who gets back up. Is that what you think when you ask the question, why is Luffy the man who's going to save this country? I didn't have an answer until Cursor talking, and then my brain kind of started processing it again, but I think that's what I'm gonna stick with, is that, A... Uh, he has more determination than other people. B, he's saved by people a lot. Without old man, without old man Toto, he wouldn't have figured out the water weakness. Without uh, Robin slash Miss uh, All Sunday, he wouldn't have been dug out of the thing. Without Pell, he wouldn't have made it back. The other thing is that he's fighting for his friends. I wonder if the Quick Claw crew were friends with Vivi, or if they just saw her as their princess. As and their like, princess. This is their duty. Right. Well, and him being saved by people goes back to kind of to his determination, really, because everybody who sees Luffy sees what he is willing to do to achieve his goals, and they go, wow, I should, I should help that guy out. He draws people to him in a way that n- m- no other characters really do. This just in, we figured it out. Luffy's true power is not his determination. It's not his rubber powers. It's not even his crew. It's his power of being a pure bun. He is a cinnamon roll. Welcome to Meme Talk, Curtis. I know that you're the least familiar with this, but a a bun is just a pure and innocent soul. It's like a child that you want to protect. Uh, it's like, yeah. It also can be that. short for bunny. The other thing that I think about Luffy... um why he's going to be the man to save this country goes all the way back to the first couple of episodes when he said to Kobe that if he dies trying to become king of the pirates, then he dies. Luffy is willing to sacrifice himself and the people around him if it means getting to this important goal. And I shouldn't say the people around him because that makes him sound like Crocodile. He doesn't spend lives frivolously, but he knows that when you are fighting for something important, sometimes there are casualties and that's okay as long as they keep fighting. And I I would say that he knows that everybody around him is has come comes voluntarily, right? Right. Knowing that that is a possibility. So it's not like it's not like Crocodile where I would say he does. He sacrifices people against their will. Mm-hmm. Like everybody who has put their lives on the line for Luffy has done it of their own volition. Right. They had informed consent. I would slightly disagree. I I agree with most of your points. I would not use the word sacrifice when describing Luffy's actions. He's not going to go in and say, "I'm going to give my life so I can beat Crocodile." He's going to go in giving it at all. Not planning to die, but willing to accept if he does die. And so, again, I just, the word sacrifice has certain connotations, and it's not, he's the exact opposite of the quick claw crew. I need to call them by their real name. What are they? The, uh, they are the, the kicking, kicking claw. Kicking yeah. claw force. Yes. Because they don't have the alliteration thing, which is silly. But, anyways, they literally said, we're going to give our lives so that the country might prosper in our absence. But Luffy seems to be like, a, I'm going to, I'm going to fight and I'm not going to, I'm not willing to just give up, okay, which is okay. what dying is. I, That's fair. I, I would rephrase it. I think, I think we're on the same page. I wouldn't say that he goes in, w- like, you know, willing to accept the fact that he might die. Like, like he doesn't go in and, and say, I'm going to give it my all, but if I die, that's okay. Because mm-hmm. I think if, like, even when he's close to death, he's like, that's unacceptable, right? That's true. Um, I think it's just that he's not afraid of death, okay. right? Or he's not, he's not, he's not afraid of the danger. He sure. just assumes that if he gets to a point where he gets close to death, he's just going to find, 
find a you know the power out. somewhere in there and like he said to Vivi, you think you can end this country or this war without anyone dying or getting hurt and you can't like he knows what the possible consequences of his actions are even if he doesn't intend to die he knows that it could happen yes i would also slightly disagree i'm sorry to be so pedantic no, uh, but cool. you said that uh, Luffy was willing to let the people around him die, or he was willing to... I highly disagree that Luffy could handle the death of even a single crewmate, but he's willing to fight at 1,000% and put himself in harm's way to make sure that he can protect that. He's doing the Zoro thing, but he's doing it on a subconscious level. He didn't have to have an episode where he had to figure it out. Well, and to be clear, um, I realized as I was saying those words that they were wrong, but... Uh, but the thing about Luffy is that he knows instinctively the lesson that Usopp and Chopper had to learn, where you can't constantly be looking over your shoulder to make sure the guy next to you is all right. You have to trust that he is strong enough to do his part so that you can focus on doing mm -hmm. yours. Yep. And in Luffy's mind, there's no such thing as a weak crew member. They might not be as strong as him, but they can hold their own and he has faith in them. That's why he asked him to join his crew. Uh, to talk about Luffy and Crocodile's fight specifically, I the Something I like in this arc about both their first fight and then what we've seen so far of their current fight, though I guess we'll talk about this more next time, um, assuming that we don't just randomly have four filler episodes all of a sudden. Bold of you to assume. We get four episodes of an AU where they're all in high school together. Um, Zanji, it's Z Z Z Z Z uh, Zoro is actually a cheerleader. And Sanji is the chef in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chopper is actually just a doll that Usopp carries around. But Usopp, Aww. Nami, and Luffy are all just uh, high school children. Go oh. on. <laughs> um, okay. I, so in the, in the first fight that Luffy has with the crocodile in the desert, he gets super close to death. And it, I, I mentioned this when we did that episode. But it's the first time we've seen Luffy, Luffy just, like, hit a wall, right? Yes. Where he couldn't just power through it. And I think it's really interesting that this is the first time he's had to out... He had to outthink a situation, right? Sure. So he comes in with the water this time because he observed in the last time... The last time he faced Crocodile that when he got wet, he could, you know, he could hit him then. Um I just I think that's really interesting. It's a new development for Luffy, and I think it's going to be important because I'm sure it's a sign of things to come. Because if if this was just more of a Dragon Ball Z, just I need to get stronger, 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 and just keep you know punching, yeah, basically. punching harder, it wouldn't be as interesting. But instead, he has to come up with a strategy and think his way around it. I like that. My question is: Water is a finite resource in Alabasta, especially right now. So first of all. Where the heck did he get it from? And what is going to happen when he runs out? Do you think that he can just go get more from where he got it from? Or do you think that he can end the fight before he runs out of water? Um, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. I, I It'll probably be an issue in the fight. Like he'll start running. Either he will run low and notice or more likely for Luffy, he will run out and be like, oh, crap, that's right. I had a limited supply. Um if I had to guess, because they talked about it at the very beginning, someone's going to bring a brain powder. Like, it, it, either they have some nearby or something. And I think that's what's going to do it. Quick, people of Alabasta, spit on Crocodile. <laughs> Everyone, if we just join together, we all Gross. spit on him. <laughs> the ultimate humiliation for Crocodile. He's such a he's such a diva. You know, I forgot how much he loves to monologue and how he's much a he likes to. For sure. He would hate that. He would <laughs> swear revenge when he'd be unable to do anything about oh, it. Oh, I love that so mm. much. Did you guys have any ideas on where he might have gotten it from? I don't think I have enough oh, info. Um, to guess. I, I know it's scarce, but there is still water around, right? Any town or city that exists in Alabasta will have some source of water, even We're, if it's limited. Vivi specifically said that water isn't a problem in Rain Base, and that's the city that they had just left, so that's where Pell took them. I don't know what's going to happen if he runs out of water, or maybe I do know what's going to happen, but that's where he got the initial barrel. It would have been great, though, if he had gone all the way back to Yuba and the old man had been like, I uncovered this well full of water here, but you can take it all to fight that man. That would be pretty good. He should have brought the old man with him. <laughs> yes, with his two dual-wielding shovels. Yes. Perfect. Uh, 
I actually don't have any other final thoughts. Um, I think I we've done a good job of exhausting all my thoughts throughout this episode. Does anyone else have any final thoughts? Jackal fruit. Chuck ate the jackal jackal fruit. He's a jackal man and mm-hmm. he's a good boy. He's a good boy. I don't like Chaka's human form, but I would I would scratch his ears if he were just in jackal form all the time. His jackal form is much better. Like I, it doesn't yes. have a dumb haircut. Yep. Here's my question. Right now, we have not seen any evidence of uh, how do I want to say this? We don't know how long devil fruits are around. Is there only ever the one gum gum fruit that Luffy has eaten and once he dies, it's gone forever? We don't technically have an answer right now. But uh, Pell and Chaka are the Falcon and the Jackal, which are the two guardian deities of Alabasta along with the Sea Cat. So did they just happen to know that they were the chosen? Did, like, did they know that the anime bubble the story was going to come to them soon they're like we got to eat these fruits so thematically we fit in with this country no lie i was going to literally ask this identical question so i'm glad you brought it up curtis what do you think i think i guess my assumption has been that devil fruit powers are like avatar the last airbender once one of them dies the devil fruit shows up again somewhere else and someone else can get the power i'm thinking that in this case those fruit show up in Alabasta every time. Either that, or they specifically send people out to find them in the world so that their guardian, they can have because their guardian. it's so important yes. to their country. I like that a lot. Here's a, here's a question. Luffy can't turn his rubberness off, right? He's actually, he's like physically rubber. Does that mean that the rubber's in his DNA? If he has a child... Will the child be rubbery if he has a yeah, child? Yeah, can you with... pass down uh, devil fruits via genetics? That's interesting. I I doubt it. I feel like we if that, if you could, considering how old this world is, there'd be a lot more people with devil fruit like mm. blood. One hundred percent, and it'd be more of a thing. Also, if you were a Zoan, do you have to be in half animal form? That's kind of weird. And if you're a Logia, do you have to be in your element form? Oof. Imagine no, doing no. the do with the crocodile. We've only had Sandy. three. We've had sand, we've had smoke, and we've had fire. None of those sound pleasant. Smoker would be the best, though, because he wouldn't burn you and he wouldn't be itchy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And that has been your doot, 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 final thought. What goes here? Outro goes here. So ends the next leg of the King of the What Now adventure. We're sad to see you go, but we'll be here next week. If you crave some social interaction with us in the meantime, you can find us on all sorts of different media. We have Gmail, Patreon, and Tumblr. All of those are King of the What Pod. King of the What Pod at gmail.com, patreon.com slash King of the What Pod, King of the What Our Twitter handlers are a little bit different. You can reach me at K O T W N underscore pod. And you can contact me, Curtis, at Pirate Co-Host. Also, please take a moment to rate and review our podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen. Not only will this help others find the podcast, but your constructive feedback will help us improve the show as we go. Thanks so much for giving us a listen. Until next time, follow your dreams and protect your treasure. Remember, it doesn't need to be literal treasure.